what we also want to talk about is the way in which we naturally remember things incorrectly, um, which is a big specialty of yours. Mm -hmm. Before uh, I let you talk about it, we do have a video on this topic, a really funny one, so take a look. So it's my eighth birthday party, a very happy day in the life of little Jonah. And me and my cousin Ben are throwing our birthday party together. We've shared a birthday really since we were little kids. He's a year older than me, but we'd always kind of celebrate it together. And we're having a great time, you know, eating cake, opening presents. And the last thing we do is we're playing pinata. And my cousin Ben, that little bugger, he takes the bat, takes my turn at the pinata, cracks open my pinata, and I am furious. I'm so mad. He's stolen my thunder. And we get in this nasty fight going at it all because of the pinata. I was really upset about it. And this is a story I've told again and again and again about the day my eighth birthday party was ruined by my own cousin. A couple years ago, I'm talking to my cousin Ben, and I'm saying, do you remember when you ruined my eighth birthday party with, you know, that pinata, and you busted my pinata and broke all the candy, it should have been my turn? Do you remember that? And he looks at me like I've lost my mind. On your eighth birthday party, I was at camp 600 miles north. There is no way I could have ruined your birthday party. And as soon as he told me he wasn't there, I knew it was all made up. I knew I'd invented the story and just told it again and again and again. I had no idea why I invented it. I have no idea where it came from. It was just this fiction that I'd somehow woven into my identity. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I've been accused of doing similar things. So um, why do we do this? How does something like that happen and what are the various forms of misremembering? Is that the right way to say it? Yeah, I think you did pretty well there for a TV reporter. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that was coming. <laughs> um, Scientists. <laughs> we've, we've already heard from these wonderful scientists on the panel uh, some findings and ideas that suggest that memory is a little more complicated than we might think. It's not as straightforward as we might think. It's certainly not like just bringing up a file on a computer and Examples of memory distortion or what some of us in psychology call false memories, such as we just saw in the Jonah Lehrer example, are really dramatic illustrations of this point. If when we remembered, all we were doing was kind of shining a light on an image in the brain, well, we couldn't have memories like we just heard or the experience of memory because that event had never happened. Now, these kinds of observations provide very important clues for memory researchers because they tell us that memory is what some of us like to think of as constructive. When we remember an event from our past, yeah, we are drawing on information that we've actually experienced, but sometimes that we're combining that uh, incorrectly with other things that we may not have experienced or we're mixing up elements of our experience. And these kinds of mistakes can have very important consequences in everyday life and particularly in the legal system. So let's, let's look at another example that in some ways even more extreme than the video that we just saw. This is an, uh, a, an example taken from a memory researcher himself. His name is Donald Thompson. If I could have the uh, Donald Thompson slide, there's a picture of him. He uh, received his PhD in memory research at the University of Toronto where I got my PhD working with the same uh, mentor, Endel Tulving, a leading figure in memory research, coined the terms episodic and semantic memory. Donald Thompson then went back to his native Australia and carried on a career there doing research in memory. Um, and all that was going along fine until one day when a stunning event occurred. The police came to his door and informed him that he was accused of brutally raping a woman who had in fact been brutally raped. There was no question about that. And she remembered him so clearly and so specifically that she was actually able to lead the police through her detailed recollection to his door, hence this stunning accusation. Well, fortunately for Thompson, he had an airtight alibi. He could not possibly have committed this rape because at the moment it was committed, he was giving a live television interview about, of all things, memory and memory distortion. <laughs> Well, what happened? The woman who was raped was watching that interview when an intruder broke into her house and raped her. And she mixed up 
her accurate memory of Thompson's face from the TV screen and the rapist. She kind of mixed those two things up. And this in memory research is something we call a misattribution error. We remember some aspect of an experience correctly. She remembered Thompson's face from the TV screen correctly, but we get the source wrong. And misattribution is one of the seven sins I, of memory I talk about in the book on, on the seven sins. And it's a really interesting one because it shows how when we misarrange elements of our experience that, that actually occurred, our memory can get us into trouble. This woman had great confidence in her memory. And that's another characteristic of these misattributed memories. People have great uh, confidence in them. Uh, they'll swear up and down that the events occurred. And we know that, in fact, from re research on DNA exoneration of people who have been wrongfully convicted of crimes, that memory errors of the, kinds that, the kind we've just looked at um, are among the most frequent causes of these wrongful convictions of people who have now been set free uh, who didn't have an airtight alibi the way that Thompson did. I often think, suppose that interview that had been played was taped and he didn't have the alibi, what would have happened? Well, thankfully it was live.